from analog. Hi, Jim. You've uh, created signal up here. You're five, nine plus. You're digital. We are everywhere you want to be. This is the CQ Blind Pam's Podcast. Welcome to the CQ Blind Hams podcast and Tech Zoom for November. Hard to believe we're already in November. My name is Robert, NC5R. I will be your host for this evening. And I'm excited about this topic. It's something I don't know anything about. So I'm looking forward to learning about it. Um, I did want to announce that uh, um, Angelo asked me to please let everyone know that, uh, as m- most everyone knows, the the uh, Blind Hams Bridge has several nets uh, during the week, and we are currently looking for people who are interested in being a net control operators for those nets. You can get information about the nets at uh, blindhams.com and uh, can get in touch with um, Joel or Chris Miller or any of us really and can get it figured out uh, how to help you get going if you would like to control one or more of the nets. We have quite a few people that work in various ways to bring this CQ uh, Blind Hams Tech Zoom every month. And unfortunately, several of them are not able to be with us this evening. But as always, we have Angelo into DYN running the controls and maestroing the what will eventually become a podcast of this particular Tech Zoom. Thank you for all that you do on that uh, podcast editing and and everything else, Angela. And we also have uh, one of the CQ Blindham podcasters from the heart of New York City with us this evening, Steve, uh, WB2KTV. If you don't mind, please unmute yourself and say hi to everyone. Okay, good evening, everybody. This is WB2KTV. Uh, I have not created a podcast yet, because it seems like every time I come up with a good idea for one, somebody's beat me to it. So I've got to get a little bit faster on the ideas generating. But uh, I do like what I've heard, all 80 odd of them by now. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure tonight will be no exception. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, Steve. Do we have any other CQ Blind Hams podcasters who are currently on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting who would like to unmute and and introduce yourselves? If you do, please go ahead at this time. All right, nothing heard. Well, let's go ahead and get right into the business at hand here. Uh, This evening, we're going to have a talk that's, that's of interest to me and I think of interest to a lot of people on low power mesh networking using LoRa radio. And I'm looking forward to learning all about it. We're fortunate to have with us Bruce KC1 FSZ to talk with us all about low power mesh networking. And Bruce, when you're willing and able, please go ahead and Unmute yourself, and if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about who you are, and then go ahead and launch right into whatever you want to tell us about low-power mesh networking. It's a pleasure to have you here this evening. Yeah, very good, Robert. Uh, Thank you very much for having me on board, and um, I understand Joel might be under the weather if he's listening. Uh, Thanks so much to Joel for inviting me, and... uh, Thanks to the whole crew. Uh, exciting to be on board here. So I'm, yeah, so I'm Bruce, Casey one fsz and um, I'm here to share with you some information about a um, club project that we've been working on. Um, I spoke to this group during the summer. Um, I think it might have been in your August meeting. 
um, about the nano VNA. So I know I've actually met a bunch of you already. And um, I was very excited when I heard that you had um, turned that talk into a podcast. So now I've been telling my kids that I'm a legitimate uh, podcast celebrity. Um, so it's it's uh, quite exciting for me as well. But uh, just, just to quickly introduce myself, um, I've been interested in electronics and computers and radio since I was a young kid. Um, I attempted the FCC novice exam twice uh, when I was about 10, I think, and um, I actually failed it both times um, on the CW portion. So that was pretty much it for me. Um, but I learned um, that the CW requirement had been dropped about 10 years after after the fact. Um, so I ran back to the um, local radio club and got my technician's ticket and uh, passed my extra exam later in 2016. So um, right now, I guess you could say I'm trying to make up for lost time. Um, I do some operating, um, but the part of the hobby that I like the most uh, is building. Um, almost everything in my station is uh, homebrew of one form or another. And um, I think, to me anyway, experimentation um, is a crucial part of amateur radio. So I try to avoid using commercial gear as much as possible because um, the fun of trying to make it work yourself is pretty interesting to me. So. Uh, the one thing I'll say is that everything I know about RF electronics is self-taught. Um, I'm guessing there may be some legit RF engineers on the line. Uh, so please feel free to correct any mistakes in this presentation, because uh, I'm sure there are probably some. Uh, in terms of the project that I'm going to speak about tonight, um, as Robert mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, low-power mesh networks um, using LoRa radios. And before I start explaining this somewhat crazy project, I think it's important to share a little bit of context about what we were trying to accomplish. And because uh, this, is, this is an idea that came out of um, uh, a search for a good club project uh, for the Wellesley Amateur Radio Society here in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And we, uh, we basically had five goals. Um, the first was obviously to demonstrate the feasibility of building a low cost mesh network using LoRa radios. The second goal was to actually construct a practical digital mesh network that can pass text messages around town here and uh, into some neighboring towns around us. The third goal was to create an engaging club project that anyone could participate in if they wanted. Um, I, th you know, I think we've all done enough club builds of uh, Morse code keys and uh, wire antennas, so we thought it was maybe time to try something a little bit unusual. Uh, the fourth goal was to try to maintain a very low barrier to entry. So in other words, come up with a pretty cheap project. And then the fifth goal, probably the most important one, was to avoid receiving any letters from the FCC Enforcement Bureau uh, related to any part of our project. And so far, I think we're on pretty good track for those goals. Um, so just a, a very quick overview of what we're talking about before we get into some of the details. Um, my collaborator on this project, Charlie Burris, uh, WA3ITR, and I uh, built a network of small, low-cost digital repeater stations that can be used to pass text messages between two operators um, here in the Wellesley area. And uh, this technology is intended to be used for interactive text QSOs, pretty similar to what you might experience having a QSO with someone on RIDI or PSK31 or possibly even JS8 call. Um, it's a text-oriented conversational uh, type QSO that we're targeting. And um, sometimes I, I get asked like, aren't, well, aren't there easier ways to send text messages? Um, and the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> But I guess you could probably argue that this entire hobby is about doing things that could be done in other ways much easier. Um, but those other ways are always much less interesting. So, uh, so we're excited about this uh, nonetheless. Um, I think what brought this project to the attention of many people was something a little bit unusual, which is that the repeaters for our initial network were enclosed in birdhouses. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, I think there was some 
that made it a little bit unusual. And uh, I think that drew some attention to the project. We also have stations that are uh, what we call desktop stations, which are much less interesting. It's just a, a block of wood with electronics on it. Um, and the desktop stations have a wire that connects uh, the station to a computer using a USB cable. And there's a serial command interface that can be used to send and receive messages into the desktop um, stations. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but back to the repeaters, you know, whenever I talk about this project, the question immediately comes up like, what's, what's the deal with the birdhouse? Like, why are we, why are, <laughs> why are the stations built in birdhouses? And I'll tell you, I chose the birdhouse enclosure for three reasons. Um, the first is that I enjoy woodworking. So that's always a fun thing. Um, the second is that the birdhouses have the advantage that they blend into the environment very well. And this has the advantage of allowing us to install repeater stations in a lot of different locations that strictly speaking, we might not always have explicit permission to use. So in other words, it's, um, it's pretty easy to stick one of these stations in a tree somewhere and um, no one will even notice it because it's a birdhouse. Um, I think it's kind of an amusing story also, and it's, it's turned out to be good marketing with our neighbors because you know, a tasteful wooden birdhouse sitting in a tree is much less threatening than a gray PVC or steel enclosure with an antenna sticking out the end. So it's kind of a psychological thing, I guess. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the background behind the birdhouse. So there's nothing significant other than that. Um, but what, as I mentioned before, just talk about the capabilities of the network. What it can do is it can pass a text message between stations and an interactive QSO. Um, the important thing here is that the stations, the repeater stations, are completely autonomous. There are no strings attached. Um, so these stations can be placed anywhere where there's good uh, sun exposure. Um, and then the other, I think, important benefit of, of the project is that the design emphasis low cost, the target cost for a station um, is about $50. And I think we've been able to keep it into that, into that area. Um, I will mention some caveats and limitations um, because there's, uh, there's always uh, some downsides to these things. First, um, the bandwidth is very low. Um, the system that we're talking about has something, the bandwidth would probably be something similar to the old uh, 1200 baud packet modems that we talked about. This is not a high speed digital network by any stretch. Uh, the other important thing is that the distance between the stations is important. Our experience in uh, residential areas is that we can get about between one and two kilometers of range on these stations. Um, anything past that, we need to have repeaters to fill in the fill in the gaps. Uh, the other thing that I get asked a lot is um, just a clarification. This is not an IP network, um, although there's nothing stopping that. The packet formats and the address protocols and everything that we're talking about here is proprietary and unique to our project. Um, the other caveat, which hopefully will um, become clear later, is that the routing mechanism that we're using to allow messages to be passed between these stations um, is static at the moment. Um, when a node is added or removed from the network, we need to update the routing table so that um, messages know how to traverse through the network. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that because that's actually an area of active development. Um, other important caveats, solar siting is quite important. Um, we need to have at least a couple of good hours of sunlight each day to keep the stations running. Um, and if we don't, and if this depends on weather conditions, the stations will go down um, if they've had more than a couple of days of very cloudy conditions. Um, so anyway, those are the, those are the main trade-offs. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about what mesh networking actually is and how the routing works. As mentioned, the goal is to create a series of uh, repeater stations that are spread out throughout an area um, and they form what's called a mesh and the prototype networks that we've built successfully have, um, we have one, we built one that had seven um, stations scattered around town and the, um, the key thing here is that in a mesh network, any station can be added to the network at any time 
as long as it can hear and talk to at least one other station on the existing network. So that's, that's the key thing is we need to make sure that any new station can see at least one and more than one is fine too, um, but the minimum is one. Um, and as mentioned before, messages that are being passed through this network get on and off of the mess network using a PC that's connected to uh, one of the desktop stations via a USB interface. So the operators would sit in front of a, uh, a serial terminal on their PC and type messages into the network. And through a series of commands, they can uh, pass those networks, those messages to any other station um, that's available at the time. Um, the messages will hop from station to station across the mesh. So um, a routing mechanism is used to determine when a message is received on a station, it's able to look at the destination of that message and understand what's the next hop. And um, once that message is successfully handed to the next station in the mesh, then it's done. And um, it's responsibility of the next station to move it um, forward successfully, uh, successively, um, um, not unlike um, a packet network or anything else where you're involving message ha handling where stations receive messages and then deliver them onto the next hop. And as mentioned, there's a proprietary message format that's critical to this entire process. And that message format um, contains the information about where a message came from and where it's headed uh, so that the nodes on the mesh network understand what to do next. Um, this message format is fully documented. Um, Robert, I'll send along to you a few links if you'd like to distribute them to the, to the rest of the team here. Um, if anyone is interested in reading a little bit about how the messages are formed, um, that information is available. Um, and um, as I'll mention later, <laughs> That's quite important because we want to make sure that we're fully FCC compliant. And uh, one of the requirements for compliance is that we need to make sure that all the message protocols are documented and open for anyone to implement. So there's no, no secrets here about how the system works. Um, so that's a little bit about the overall operation of the network. Um, I should probably talk about radios a little bit since this is a ham radio presentation. Um, if I don't talk about radios, you all might never invite me back. So I'll, I'll speak about that part of it. Um, the inside of these birdhouses contain a small PC board um, that contains the electronics that run um, the station. And um, the original prototypes of these PC boards were a little bit messy. Um, I've recently made a commercial uh, PCB that integrates many of the components to make it easier for people to um, assemble these stations. Um, and the most important piece here is that each station contains a tiny uh, 100 milliwatt radio, which is about the size of a postage stamp. And uh, this is the LoRa radio, which I'll describe in more detail, but that's the heart of the system. And um, just to give you a sense of the type of radio we're talking about, these radios typically cost us about four or five dollars. So it's a, a very inexpensive, very small, very low power radio. But this radio has some interesting characteristics that we've been exploiting in this project. Um, it's my belief that the project is fully FCC part 97 compliant. Um, we've not received any enforcement letters yet. And I think we've uh, made a strong effort to make sure that we're following all the rules. Uh, we're running the mesh network on 33 centimeter uh, ham band at the moment. That's the 900 megahertz band. Uh, we've had our network um, coordinated by the New England Spectrum Management Council. So, um, and according to their band plan, the frequency that they've asked us to operate on uh, 906.5 megahertz is allocated for mixed use. Um, as mentioned, there's no encryption used anywhere in the network um, and call signs are incorporated into our message format to ensure that everything that we're doing is following all of the Part 97 requirements. Um, one question I get asked, and I should probably mention at this point, um, people ask me, is this the same as the Arden project, if you've heard of that? Um, uh, the answer is no, this has nothing to do with Arden. <clears throat> um, 
if you're familiar with Arden, um, it's a it's a quite an awesome project, and I would strongly encourage everyone to go check it out. Um, if you're not familiar, the Arden team is doing something a little different. They're using off-the-shelf Wi-Fi equipment to build an IP mesh network that runs on ham frequencies. And if you're if you want to be doing high bandwidth, um, <clears throat> making phone calls or downloading movies into your emergency communication shelter or something of that nature, then Arden is definitely the project for you. Um, the LoRa Birdhouse Mesh Network aims to be much, much lower power, much lower cost, and I think more approachable to builders and experimenters um, than the Arden project. Um, but the one thing that these two projects do have in common is that the radios that we're using were originally intended for something else. They were originally intended to be used on the ISM bands, um, but fortunately, again, similar in both projects, the radios that we're using can be tuned into the amateur spectrum, which is very useful. So we're able to leverage uh, ISM radios in the ham frequencies in both cases. Um, so probably here is a good time to speak a little bit about what LoRa means, uh, because um, LoRa is the, I guess, the critical piece of what we're trying to do. And LoRa spelled L-O-R-A um, is an acronym of sorts, and it stands for long range. And um, LoRa is a extremely unique uh, modulation technique that was developed by two uh, French engineers, uh, Nicolas Sornin and Olivier Seller. Um, in this uh, modulation technique was developed in 2010. And these guys did this as a side project. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, this was something that they were doing on their own time. And also, as far as I can tell, neither were hams, um, although I'm not positive about that. Um, but these two guys observed that most of the wireless industry was focused on the other side of the uh, of the extreme. They were focused on increasing bandwidth, increasing complexity, increasing cost. And they chose to focus on the exact opposite extreme, lower power, lower data rates, and lower costs. And so while the rest of the industry was racing from 3G to 4G to 5G, they jokingly call the LoRa technology 0G. And I think that's a pretty good name for it. Um, the market that they had in mind for this particular type of radio was originally um, gas, water, and electricity meter reading applications. I think they had a vision that um, meeting, uh, reading meters could be automated if um, a cheap enough um, and low, low enough power radio was invented. <clears throat> And uh, that, that was what they were originally thinking. I think later the technology was used for a number of other things. But just to give you an idea um, of what, they're, what they came up with, the link budget for this particular modulation technique and these radios that they came up with is about 160 dB, which is pretty impressive. So the question is, like, how is it possible um, to have such a, such a large link budget for such a small radio? And it all comes down to the modulation technique that they've designed. Uh, LoRa uses a modulation called chirp spread spectrum. Um, the chirp is nice because it's very compatible with the birdhouse concept. Um, but um, this is a very interesting modulation technique and it's actually been used in uh, radar applications for a long time. Um, <clears throat> some interesting characteristics, um, this modulation technique uses the entire bandwidth that's allocated um, at all times. So it has very good noise immunity. Um, the modulation technique is very resistant to certain types of interference, particularly um, multipath interference, and also is very resistant to Doppler type effects. Um, and it turns out that we, we weren't the first to invent this. Um, it turns out that dolphins and bats also use a form of chirp sped spectrum for ranging and understanding like when you're about to run into something for all of exactly the same reason. So I think nature recognized the advantage of um, the, the, um, the, this robust uh, modulation technique. Um, it turns out it works very well when you have a lot of noise and things bouncing all over the place. 
like you might find on the 33 centimeter ham band at the moment. And uh, turn on your radio and listen and you'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on out there. Um, I would note that um, the chirp sped spectrum um, is a special case of a more general type of modulation called frequency hopping sped spectrum um, that has its own set of interesting characteristics that I won't get into today. But um, if you're interested, definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, it doesn't seem to be used much on ham bands, but I think there's a lot of potential for um, ham applications of um, uh, spread spectrum radio technology, especially as noise becomes more and more of a problem. Um, so talking a little bit about the advertised data rates for LoRa, since that's the thing that people are most interested in. Uh, first of all, the, the LoRa um, technology um, gives some estimates of speeds and distances. What they, they estimate that under ideal conditions, which essentially at line of sight, the technology is capable of 10 kilometers of uh, distance with these 100 milliwatt radios. I actually believe that and I've seen people on the internet doing experiments a lot along those lines. As mentioned, distances in typical suburban areas are about one to two kilometers. Um, actually, there's a the record for the largest uh, terrestrial transmission with a LoRa radio was actually 700 kilometers, um, which was done with a, a 25 milliwatt uh, transceiver on 2.4 gig, which is amazing. Um, that was line of sight with some nice antennas. Uh, but it just shows you, you know, 700 kilometers on a 25 milliwatt radio. That's a 14 dBm um, radio. That's quite impressive. Uh, the record for extraterrestrial transmission with a LoRa radio was actually a moon bounce. Uh, somebody did. Um, it was achieved last November, and that was a little longer. That was a 730 kilometer uh, round trip um, uh, transmission, which is equally impressive. Um, anyway. The, back to the story about Laura, uh, these two these two guys, Nicholas and Olivier, joined up together with a business developer and they formed a company, uh, which was called Ciclio, to develop this technology even further. And their company was acquired um, by Semtech, which is a large um, RF uh, components manufacturer in 2012. Um, Semtech paid uh, $5 million dollars. Um, to acquire Ciclio, including their patents. And Semtec went on to develop a series of radio chips that have fully commoditized the LoRa technology. Um, the LoRa modulation and encoding standards are completely proprietary to Semtec. Nothing is documented. Uh, Semtec owns the patents um, to this technology. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, just a little background in case you're not familiar, Semtec is is uh, at least here in the US is located in Southern California. And it's currently, uh, this company currently has a market cap of about about $3 billion. So this is a big company. If you look look in their financials, uh, they reported um, last year, $740 million in revenue related to their LoRa um, IoT business. So that $5 million investment in the sm small startup looks like it was a pretty smart move. Um, given the revenues. Um, Semtech also claims to have produced over 175 million LoRa radios. Um, so this is clearly a mass market device now with commodity economics. And if you have a municipal water meter in your house or your apartment or uh, a municipal uh, electric meter, um, you probably have one of these radios in your house already um, because that's, um, that's how the remote uh, meter reading technology works. Um, I guess one other side note about Laura. Um, coincidentally, my life, my wife is named Laura, um, and she thinks I've named this entire project after her. So uh, please don't tell her otherwise. Uh, let's see. So more details about um, the Laura modulation technique itself. Um, the Laura physical layer um, has three parameters that can be adjusted depending on your application. And this is interesting because these parameters allow you to make some trade-offs between uh, power consumption and signal to noise ratio. So it's, it's a versatile protocol because you get to decide um, of how this thing is set up given your application. And this is a long discussion in itself, but 
essentially there are three key parameters that you can control. Um, you can control the bandwidth of the channel. You can control something called the spreading factor, um, which I'll mention in a second. And uh, you can also control the coding rate, which is essentially um, what percentage of the message um, is allocated to error correction. And um, I think there's actually some pretty interesting work to be done here to figure out what's the best combination for amateur uh, use um, in terms of these parameters. But I've settled on a couple of settings which seem to be um, a good compromise and um, are able to give us the, the one to two uh, kilometer range um, with enough low power to run this thing on a very simple solar, um, solar arrangement. Um, as mentioned, the modulation technique uh, involves the generation of a FM chirp. And um, essentially, the way this works is that different symbols in the uh, coding methodology are represented by different phases of the chirp. So um, if you listen to this, what you'll hear is it's a chirp, um, but the chirp is broken up into different pieces and starts and stops in different places, depending on which symbol it is that you're trying to transmit. So um, I mentioned a second ago that um, LoRa is a proprietary technology that's undocumented and is patented. And so um, one question that comes up is like, that must be illegal, right? We can't do undocumented um, proprietary things on, uh, on ham bands. And fortunately, um, it turns out that um, the LoRa protocol um, has been reverse engineered and fully documented. So um, uh, we don't we, we can safely say that the the uh, the modulation technique is actually available. And and you know if you look at the rules, um, you know one of the critical part of the Part 97 ham uh, FCC regulations are required that no encryption should be used by hams to quote uh, obscure the meaning of their transmissions. And um, I actually think like as a builder, I actually think the use of undocumented stuff on the ham bands is, is a bad idea in general. Um, and it, I guess at the risk of offending someone, I, I'm still a little puzzled as to how the DMR people get away with this, given that the um, AMBI Kodak uh, has not been documented and nor has it been reverse engineered, to my knowledge anyway. Um, and Laura would be in the same situation, except for the fact that researchers have successfully reverse engineered, documented, um, the entire protocol. And um, there's a person by the name of Matt Knight who has done this work um, using a program called GNU Radio. And he's published his findings on the internet and is, his stuff is really interesting. Um, there are a couple of really good um, papers out there. In fact, he, he succeeded in building a radio um, that works this protocol. So you could build your own LoRa radio from scratch if you wanted to. Um, and I'm actually working on this myself. Um, but the good thing is, um, I'm pretty sure that we don't need to worry about um, getting any letters from the FCC. Um, I think if you built your own radio, I guess there's a different question about whether the Semtec legal team would contact you. I can't answer that. Um, uh, do your own research on that one. Um, anyway, so that's that's a quick overview of the of the LoRa protocol. And as mentioned, you know the 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 key thing for us, what we're doing here with this low power system is taking advantage of the um, strong noise immunity characteristics of the protocol. Um, so let's talk about the hardware a little bit. Um, I'll just quickly walk through the parts that were used to design this system. And uh, one critical theme that you're gonna hear throughout here is the, is the concept of commoditization. Um, the closer you can stay to using commoditized parts, uh, the cheaper everything is. So that's the name of the game. And um, I won't talk about it again, but the heart of the project is a Semtec radio. Um, the model number is SX1276. If you want to go look it up, it's actually Semtec's first LoRa product. Um, the Semtec radio um, is quite small and very difficult to work with um, from a soldering standpoint. Um, and fortunately, um, other companies um, have built larger modules that, inc that incorporate the um, Semtec radio um, specifically, the one that we're using is is made by a Chinese company called Hope RF. So they take the tiny radio and mount it onto a um, larger PC board with some other components that makes this thing 
a little bit easier to work with and importantly makes it possible to solder onto it. A um, well, few words about how the radio actually works. Um, the radios have the ability to send or receive uh, digital packets um, of up to 240 bytes in length. Um, so when the radio is turned on, um, it will basically receive any message that it can hear um, that, that matches the parameters that I described before. So if you've set your radio to the same frequency, the same bandwidth, the same spreading factor, and the same coding rate as another radio um, it, that's within earshot, it'll receive anything that it hears. Um, and the radio itself has no concept of addressing, no concept of arbitration or priorities. There's no, no packet structure enforced by the radio. It's a free for all. Basically it's 240 bytes in and 240 bytes out. It's completely up to us to decide what the message means and how to handle the message when it's um, received out of a radio. Um, the other thing I should note is that the radios are, um, are half duplex. They, they can only send or receive um, at any given time. Uh, so it's a simplex kind of system. The radios do contain a small amount of uh, memory, um, a first in, first out queue, um, so that you've got a, a little bit of time to pull the message out of the, um, out of the radio um, before the next one comes in. Um, the radio has a serial interface on it, um, which can be connected to a microprocessor, and we'll get to that in a second because that's the next major part of the system. Um, so as I mentioned before, all of the um, protocol is has to be done in software, and um, uh, a lot of the work that we've done is to come up with a software scheme to format that 240 bytes so that it can be used in a practical network. Um, other pieces of the um, other piece of the system um, also commoditized. Uh, we we have a small antenna. Um, it's a um, a commoditized 900 megahertz antenna. Um, the one that we're using is uh, actually we're, there's two that we're using right now. One of them is a rubber duck, and one of them is a uh, collinear antenna inside of a fiberglass tube. Um, both inexpensive. Uh, the next important component is a microprocessor that runs the software inside of the node. Um, it's an ESP32. Um, if you're familiar with that, um, that's a very common microcontroller used for um, different types of IoT applications. The processor is pretty inexpensive. It costs about $4. There is a battery inside of the birdhouse. Um, it's an 18650 battery, I believe, um, also commoditized. We're using a battery that was originally intended to be used in um, an e-cigarette. Um, I don't use e-cigarettes myself, but um, I think for those who are familiar with this, it's a handheld device that I guess simulates the smoking experience. <laughs> I don't know exactly how, but uh, it has a, a, um, a lithium uh, ion battery inside of it. Um, we're using that battery um, because it's produced in mass volumes and it's rechargeable and inexpensive. Um, the birdhouse has a small solar panel. Um, it's, uh, it's about a two watt solar panel. Um, it's about $3 for the solar panel. Um, it's uh, four and a half volts um, in good sunlight. Um, the package contains a very small, uh, simple, charge controller, solar charge controller that integrates the solar panel with the rechargeable battery. Um, again, an inexpensive commoditized part. Um, and um, the rest of, oh yeah, the other important piece is the wood, the wooden structure for the birdhouse. Um, we've made a, a kit. It has, uh, let's see, six parts, um, uh, two sides, a front and a back, a bottom, and a sloped roof um, for the, um, uh, for the solar panel. It does have a hole cut in the front. Um, so theoretically, a bird could actually live inside of the birdhouse, although I always put a small screen on the inside to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, perhaps a, for a future version will um, allow the birds to coexist with the electronics, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. So those are the major components of the system. Um, uh, hopefully you get the idea that we're trying to use things that are readily available to try to stay underneath the, um, the $50 price point. Um, 
One thing to talk about the hardware quickly is the importance of power management um, because we're trying to run an autonomous system on solar power. Um, one thing we discovered is that the uh, ESP32 microprocessor is actually in default mode, pretty power hungry. Um, it, depending on how you use it, it may consume as much as uh, 200 milliamps. Um, but luckily, there are a bunch of things that you can do to that microprocessor to um, improve its power consumption. Um, things like slowing down the clock rate, um, taking advantage of different sleep modes that um, are available inside the microprocessor. You can actually greatly reduce the power consumption, which is quite important to us. Um, the other thing about power management is solar location is very important. So we have to pick trees that have um, good visibility to the sun. Um, where I live, that means uh, facing south um, is important. Um, we do have uh, the ability to monitor the level of the battery from software. Um, that's important um, because when the batteries go low, um, we put the entire system into a deep sleep mode um, and tell it to wake up in a couple hours to check again. And that's needed to prevent the batteries from being damaged um, by <clears throat> drawing them down too low. Um, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the software. Um, we're almost done here. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the software is entirely homebrew. Um, it took much longer to get the software working than the hardware working, but luckily uh, the software can be changed pretty easily. Um, the software can be built using the Arduino development environment. If anyone's familiar with that, that's a very common open source programming environment for developing small um, microcontroller projects. Um, and the project is developed in a completely open source way um, on GitHub. Um, anyone who wants to um, try it out or make modifications to the software is welcome to do that. Um, we accept pull requests um, from anyone who wants to make a change. Um, I think the goal is openness in the spirit of um, spirit of ham radio. Um, I mentioned before that the way you send and receive messages is using a serial terminal. Um, um, that's actually not something that it's probably something that you were very used to back in the back in the day when we were using packet radio. And um, I think it's it's not as common anymore. But essentially, you know, you start up um, uh, one of the many serial type serial uh, terminal emulators that are available on uh, PCs or Mac machines. Um, I use something called Putty. Um, some people use something called Cool Term. There's a lot of different serial programs out there. But essentially, once you plug in the serial cable and start your um, serial emulator on your computer, um, the desktop station will send a message. Um, it'll appear on the terminal, which will give you the different commands that are available. And then you just type commands. And the most common command that we use is a command called, it's essentially a send command where you type send and the name of the station that you want to send the message to in the text. You type that in, hit enter and the message just goes out, travels, hops through the network, and when it reaches the um, destination station, that message will print out um, on the screen of the, um, of the station on the other side with information about where it came from, the call sign of the station on the other end. And so it's, again, not at all unlike what it would feel like to have a, a RIDI QSO um, with someone um, over, over HF. Um, I'll just end with a couple comments about future directions. Um, my aspirational goal is to have one of these birdhouses in the yard or on the terrace of every single licensed ham in the United States. Um, we got a little ways to go, but we'll get there eventually. Um, there's definitely work going on to improve this kit um, so that it's easier to assemble, especially for people who aren't comfortable um, soldering uh, surface mount components, which can be challenging. Um, there's, uh, this is not my area of expertise, but there are a lot of discussion about experiments with gain antennas um, to provide maybe better distance with a more directional um, path. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that the routing at the moment is static. Um, one thing that would be really interesting would be to inter introduce some sort of dynamic routing so that someone could add um, 
a repeater to the network without having to update the routing system or even possibly even a mobile capability um, so that stations could move around the network. We don't have that at the moment. Uh, one software change that is underway is a store and forward uh, mailbox capability, um, similar to what we used to have in the old school packet radio days. This would allow you to put a message into the network and leave it so that it could be collected later um, by someone who maybe wasn't there at the time that the message went across. Um, there's a little bit of work going on. I've uh, experimenting with a microcontroller that has lower power consumption. Uh, unfortunately, some of these parts are quite hard to get these days because of the uh, semiconductor shortages. So the one that the STM32 microprocessor that I'd like to use is hard to get. So we haven't really pushed that one too hard. Um, one suggestion that was made, which I've not pursued because I don't know anything about it, is the possibility of a part 15 version for use on ISM bands uh, so that um, non-HAMs could uh, use the technology. Um, and then the last thing that would be quite interesting if it was possible would be over the air um, firmware upgrades. Um, right now, when we upgrade the software, um, someone has to go visit each of the stations, um, take it out of the tree, plug in this a, a USB port and upload the software. Um, given that we have radios, it would be quite cool if you could um, actually pass the software updates through the network as well. It would probably take a while because we're on a slow connection, but that would probably be quicker than me driving around town, <laughs> uh, uh, maintaining the birdhouses. So I think that's about all I had. And um, Robert, I'd be very happy to take any questions. I don't know what time you guys want to drop off, but um, I'm certainly available if anyone has any questions um, about any part of this project. So I'll send it back to you, Robert. Well, thank you so much for that, Bruce. That was such a well done, articulate, easy to follow presentation, at least in my experience, and I thank you for that. Wow, I learned a lot of things, and the idea of a of a birdhouse with a with an e-cigarette battery that is charging solar panels sort of uh, amuses me to no end. Not to mention the fact that you're passing messages using the old uh, serial protocol, which I was very familiar with back in the days of the old Apple II and the RS-232 serial interface yep. and the, exactly. the serial cards and, and all that jazz. Um, uh, um, so yeah, I, I thank you for, for being willing to um, discuss this or a answer questions or maybe engage in a discussion. I'd like to try something a, a little bit different with this and see if it works. If it doesn't, um, I'll mute everyone and we'll go back to the more formal asking people to raise their hands. But we have a small group tonight, so I would like to invite anyone who would like to uh, dialogue with Bruce to, um, to, to, to unmute and, and ask your question or make your comment, but be considerate of others and try not to talk over top of each other. But let's see if we can just have a bit of a, a dialogue here without going through the calling on each person when they raise their hand. So anyone who would like to, to engage with Bruce, uh, somebody please step up to the microphone and go ahead. Okay, uh, this is Steve, WB2KTV. I guess I'll be first. I have uh, two questions. They're they're related. The first of which is, uh, as you know, you've been here before, so you, you know this. Uh, most of us are have a visual impairment of some kind or other, uh, which means uh, soldering on the uh, inline boards and sort of that sort of thing is prohibitive for us unless we want to go through about ten of them before we get it right. So will these things be available in pre-built, obviously for an additional uh, cost? And second of all, once we buy the stuff and put it together or have it put together in a pre-built mode, we get it home, we mount it, we power it up, we get the desktop station going, we power it up, and we get the two things to communicate how, uh, in practical application, how would we join a local network or even find out if there is one? So I got my brand new uh, uh, radio in a birdhouse home and I got it all set up and I'm ready to go 
and it's charged, and I turn it on, <laughs> and I don't hear anything. Do I assume I did something wrong? Do I assume that my local area, I'm the first one? You know, how, how does one start out with this sort of thing? Yeah, Steve, so uh, thanks for those questions. And um, for, first of all, you, you all are on the, um, the early, you all are here in the early stages of this. So I wish I, wish I could say that every town uh, in the country had like a small number of these things and it was just a matter of uh, setting up the kit and getting on the air. I think we, we've been pursuing this as a club project. So, you know, we have the ability to know like, where there are stations around us already and who's in range and that, that sort of thing. Um, I think, um, I think really taking the second part of your question, um, I think the, unfortunately right now, the chances of you uh, turning on the station and having contact with another station is basically zero at the moment. Um, this is a, uh, this is a new experiment. And, uh, you know, of course I could, I could hope that we'd get there, but uh, it'll, it'll de definitely take some time. The one thing I'll say though is, um, I probably should have mentioned this. Um, there are quite a number of commands that are built into the Syria protocol that do diagnostic type work. So like I can, even if nobody else is um, actively using this system, um, I can ping all the stations on the network from my desktop. And so that I can make sure that my station is working and that it has ability to communicate with all other existing stations on the network. Those ping commands also can return to me all kinds of useful diagnostic information about um, battery levels and solar uh, uh, voltage, uh, solar voltage levels. Uh, the diagnostic packet gives back information about how long the station has been running and a bunch of other things that we can use to um, support the network. Um, so you would be able to um, figure out whether your system was working um, electronically, um, but I, I think, um, you, my, my generally what, what you would need to do is coordinate with somebody else in your club or somebody else who was also building a station to get two stations up and then uh, agree on a time for a QSO to sit down and, and have at it. I hope that, I hope that answers your question on the first part. Um, you know, actually I have the same, uh, it, it, surface mount soldering is, is not an easy thing. Um, I have a microscope that I use um, and even that is, is challenging. That's why the, um, that's the reason why I had the commercial um, PCB made is because um, most of the people don't have the equipments needed to do that kind of soldering. And so what I've been doing is mounting the radio onto the board and then the board has through hole um, uh, soldering capability, which makes it a little bit uh, easier, but even a lot of people don't even have that kind of capability. So it does make sense that at some point we should probably make the kit that's fully assembled um, I haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, I think if there was sufficient interest, we would definitely do that because, um, you know, the goal is to have more nodes, right? Uh, I mean, there's some people who have a lot of interest in building the, the, the system and some people have no interest in building it at all. They just want to operate and I totally get that. Um, so it makes sense that we would probably, if we were to achieve the goal of lots of these things, we would definitely have to package a version of the kit that at least had all the electronics um, assembled. Um, putting the birdhouse together is is pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, yeah, the holes are already drilled, so um, that that part um, I doubt you'd have any trouble with. But um, I hear you, and and many people have asked that question for a number of reasons because there are some people who just really, frankly, don't don't even that's not their thing. The uh, the building part is not of interest, and I get that. I hope I answered your question, Steve. Let me know if I did. Uh, you did, uh, and of course. Uh, as some questions do, or some answers do, uh, they have got more questions, and this one did as well. Does your project adhere to a standard that you think will be adopted uh, less locally? In other words, uh, if somebody else in another town somewhere else decided they wanted to build uh, a mesh network, would it be likely that they would invent their own standards? Or would they look in the published literature and pick one? You know, I have no idea. Um, before I started playing with this, I didn't even, I barely even knew what a mesh network was. So one thing I'll say is that 
it's not clear to me that there are a lot of available standards floating around out there for mesh networking. Um, I think the Arden people that I mentioned before have done a nice job of documenting their approach, which is quite different. Um, their approach is they're running more power and are using a much more expensive um, set of set of equipment. Um, but they've done a really good job of documenting how their thing works. Um, they, but, they were the ones I was actually thinking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, and so it, listen. I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think they have a great project. I think they're targeting a different type of application, um, and. Truthfully, I think it's because they're using um, uh, Wi-Fi routers um, and putting firmware into the Wi-Fi routers. It's it's a much more complicated thing, which I think is a little bit more challenging for um, you know hobbyists to get involved in in terms of the um, the, the software um, itself. Um, but you know, it, it, they're probably the furthest along uh, in terms of like having um, a widely documented, um, you know, sort of quasi standard approach to creating, uh, amateur radio mesh networks for sure. Um, but I also think that they're trying to, they're focusing on a, on a different problem. Let me jump in and, um, just ask, is there anyone else who would like to, uh, engage in this dialogue with uh, Bruce and to possibly Steve as well. If you if you would, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, this is Russ Can for MLR. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I may have missed this. Uh, I came in a little bit late, but how does your computer with a in running a serial terminal communicate with the birdhouse if the birdhouse is on your roof or in a tree i didn't uh i know there's a serial communication but um i didn't hear if it's done with the radio or if it's a, a serial line going from one to the other uh that was that was one part i was kind of unclear on go ahead yeah perfect quest so um there are two styles of stations, the stations run exactly the same software. Um, one of them is the repeater station, which is built in the birdhouse. And one of them is what we call a desktop, desktop station, which you would typically just have sitting on your desk. The desktop station has the serial connector um, onto your computer. Um, and the desktop station does not have the solar panel or the battery. Um, those are, those would be the differences. So the way it would work is that you would um, uh, uh, communicate to the desktop station over the serial port, and um, the desktop station has an antenna, and its first hop um, usually is the birdhouse outside. <laughs> um, doesn't have to be. Um, in fact, my desktop station is actually able to hear sometimes um, one of a, another station um, in the area. Um, but generally, I think what most most people would do would be to configure the route so that the uh, the first hop from the desktop station would be the the birdhouse up in the tree um, and then then it would go from there um, but the nodes from an electronic standpoint are identical there's no distinction between the desktop station and the repeater we did that on purpose just to make life easier um, it's just that the desktop station has a wire hanging out of it um, and uh, um, the um, the station the desktop station is powered over the USB port as well, so it doesn't have the battery. Um, hopefully, that answers your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess you were here when uh, hopefully uh, Russ and Bruce was talking about the tiny little uh, LoRa uh, radio, which is uh, which is uh, one of the components that's built inside the birdhouse, and that's. That, that's what handles the communication on that side. Yeah, I, that, that's that was, you know, I heard all that, but I thought, well, maybe I got in late. I didn't I didn't know about the desktop. Uh, not that the half bird house, we'll call it, but the halfway house. But uh, yeah, yeah. That, that explained it. Very cool. Anybody else want to. Uh, ask uh, Bruce a question or make a comment at this point. Please unmute yourself. And go. Well, nothing heard. So 
I think that uh, everybody must have their questions sufficiently addressed at the moment. And again, I just want to really thank you, Bruce, for this presentation. It's very cool what you're doing. Uh, and and I, I think, it, it, you know, one, one of the coolest things about it, in a sense, is the creativity involved here. Um, it's, it's, this is what, in my opinion, amateur radio is all about. So hats off to you for, for doing this thing and for coming and talking to us about it. And thank you for that. Uh, my pleasure, Robert. It's, it's, uh, it's always good. It's good to have like, um, like technical type groups like yours that can actually <laughs> appreciate and understand something like this. So, uh, it's good, uh, good to connect with you guys again. And, um, uh, uh, keep in touch. Uh, any, anyone who wants to uh, follow up with any questions, uh, feel free to drop me an email. I'm good in QRZ and um, uh, happy to happy to talk anything more about it. We're going to keep tinkering and seeing if we can make it better. So that's good. Uh, well, if I could jump back in real quick, this is Russ again. Is there a website for the Laura Project? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, if you go to, um, uh, so the, the answer is the GitHub um, homepage is the website. Um, there's, and there's quite a lot of information um, inside of, um, I'm just going to look to see if, I'm just going to put my call sign and birdhouse into, into the GitHub search and just make sure it shows up. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. If you put in Laura Birdhouse, L-O-R-A, birdhouse into the main search bar on uh, github.com um, there there's only one repository that comes up on that search and if you uh, click into that you'll uh, the, the main page um, is pretty lengthy and has all the detail um, so there's not a there's not a separate website it's just it's all on github and um, that same GitHub project also has the um, the software. Um, if you're interested in um, checking that out as well, so it's all there. Um, okay, great. I can do that. Okay. Now, if you like have Steve, any... it's like Steve was saying, one question begets another question. But yep. just out of curiosity, um, I think the processor that you're using uh, uh, was it ESP32 or did I yes. get those? letters backwards or you got it esp32 um it's a pretty widely used microcontroller um that's that's used for a lot of internet of things iot style projects um it's made by uh, a chinese company called expressive and um you'll be able to find a lot of information about the esp32 the thing that was unique about that particular microcontroller that made it very popular is that it actually has um, an integrated Wi-Fi radio inside of it, which we don't use for this project. Um, um, although that's certainly something that we should make, we want to look into. Uh, that would that would not be useful for um, you know one kilometer mesh networks, but the Wi-Fi connection that's been pointed out might be a good way to do firmware upgrades <laughs> more easily without having to climb without having to climb into any trees um, but yeah the esp32 expressive um, is the part that we're using and um, it's for better or worse it's available right now like i've never had any trouble buying them whereas yeah. some of the stm32 parts that i usually use for different projects are quite hard to get right now yeah that's i wanted to, i mean it, it sounds like it must be reasonably fam or similar to the Arduino, since you're using the Arduino IDE to program yes. it, you know, uh, could the Arduino be used? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I don't see any reason. Um, the, the only thing I would say is that th this is the thing that pushed me to the ESP32 in the first place is that it has quite a lot of memory. I think the one that we're using has, um, I think it has a half a megabyte of um of RAM, and um, I think there may be a megabyte of um, non-volatile storage for the program on there. Um, there are some Arduino um, models that that um, that have a fair amount of memory. I don't think any of them get up to that size, and um, there are some 
there are some reasons why we need the memory, particularly you know, storing these messages and then forwarding them around. Um, there's a routing table and some other things that live in memory. So I think it's probably too big to fit onto the, the really small Arduinos, like the micro and the uh, nano Arduinos would probably be too small, but some of the larger Arduinos, I'm sure it would work. Okay. Um, Does the ESP32 have, uh, and we're, we're jumping to another area, but does it have uh, analog to digital conversion on it? Uh, it does, yes. All right. <laughs> um, that that is how the um, that is how the battery voltage um, and uh, solar panel voltage is being measured. So yes, okay. it does, which right. is which is pretty good. I yeah, know. it has plenty of plenty of I/O, plenty of uh, I mean, well, I said they plenty. I think it has. It does not have a. Um, it does not have a digital analog converter on it. It's it has, but it has a, um, a number of pins that can be configured to work in um, analog to digital mode, um, which makes it quite versatile. Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Yep. All right. One more call for anyone who would like to make a question or a comment before we bring this tech zoom to a close. If so, please come now. I want to thank everybody for attending and I look forward to others who weren't able to be here being able to listen to the podcast that will be produced in a few days. And this is a tech zoom for November. We do these uh, once a month, um, the second Thursday of the month. So we'll be back in December with another one. In the meantime, uh, Happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. This is Robert, NC5R, uh, bringing this tech Zoom for November to a close. So long, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and visit www.blindhams.com.